Calling to order the Cuyahoga County Committee of the Whole for Tuesday, December the 10th, 2019. Clerk, please call the roll. Calling the roll, Ms. Simon. Ms. Simon is absent at the moment. Ms. Baker? Here. Mr. Miller? Here. Mr. Tuma? Here. Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Schron? Here. Ms. Conwell? Here. Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones is absent at the moment. Ms. Brown? Ms. Stevens? Present. Council President Brady? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Um, all right. Is there any public comment? There is not, Mr. President. All right. Um, seeing as the um, executive is not here, um, what we're going to do now is uh, what we do once a year, and um, we're going to have our annual ethics training. So the Inspector General is here and the Assistant Inspector General, from what I understand. Mark Griffin, Deputy Inspector General. Mr. Griffin, can you turn on the speaker, please? That, that does work better. Uh, great. So today is part of our mandatory annual ethics training. We're going to do a very condensed version of what we do uh, normally and what is also uh, currently online. We understand we need to wrap up by 430. So uh, we will move quickly through this. Uh, with me today is Deputy Inspector General Delante Spencer Thomas. I think many of you may know him, but uh, for those of you who don't, Delante is an attorney with the county in my office. He is a graduate uh, bachelor's of Syracuse University, a master's in communications from Syracuse University. Uh, many people say it's the best communication school in the country, unless you went to Ohio University, in which case you would disagree. Uh, he has a law degree from Cleveland Marshall and a master's in labor relations from Cleveland Marshall. And Delante and I have done a, a longer online presentation, uh, but because of various technical reasons, that's not here uh, today. We've gotten great reviews. Delante and I did it together, and everyone says, Delante did a great job. I'm like, well, what about me? And they'll remember that. Um, the Golden Globes have snubbed Delante once again. Uh, but uh, with no further ado, I'd like to give you Delante Spencer Thomas who does this online and is also part of the onboard ethics education that every new county employee gives gets. Welcome. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, so hopefully we can make this as painless as possible. Um, and feel free to stop me if you have any questions or, or comments or concerns or anything like that as I, as I kind of speed through this. We up? Okay. Back off. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, um, so as you all know, I mean, the role of the agency of Inspector General, and part of the reason why we're happy to do these types of presentations is to help to build our, our culture of compliance initiative. And so one of the things we really enjoy doing is having these conversations with employees, with officials, um, to essentially go through some of the ethics code and some issues that, that we see in our office each and every single day, some of the conversations that we have in our office, um, in, in hopes that that employees and officials are mindful of some of the things that, that we encounter, some of the things that, that we naturally just encounter um, in terms of our roles in, um, in Cuyahoga County. So, so what we're going to talk about in, in our time together today includes uh, misuse of resources, misuse of position, conflicts of interest, nepotism, gifts, secondary, future employment, and political activity. And so again, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Um, and you know, you guys have Mark's con contact information, of course, if any questions come up afterwards as well. Um, <clears throat> so, so before we get started, I think it's really important to really understand what we mean by conflict, right? Because ultimately, we're talking about conflicts of interest and how we address those conflicts. And so it's important to understand what we're talking about is family and business. And so as it relates to family, so the county code um, states that family includes spouse, 
your spouse, anybody in your household, regardless of relationship, it includes your children, your siblings, your grandchildren, grandparents, nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles, in-laws, first cousins. Okay, so it does not require or does not apply to your second and third cousins twice removed. It doesn't uh, it doesn't apply to your best friend that's like a brother. It doesn't apply to your play cousins or, or anybody else that doesn't necessarily fall within within that definition. Um, it's important to note that our county code is more narrow than than the state code, um, which oft often comes up in, in issues. Um, it also relates to anybody that's related by adoption, marriage or lineal descent that essentially either you financially support or that person financially supports you. And so that's a person, if they work for the county or does business with the county, ultimately can create a conflict. Um, lastly, anybody that you claim as a dependent to the IRS. So if they, doesn't, if they don't fit within the family definition, they don't take care of you financially or you take care of them, if that person falls, um, if that person that you claim as a dependent to the IRS that's going to potentially create a conflict as well. And then in addition to family, we're also talking about business partners. And so as all of you may have out, you may have outside businesses, you may have other things going on outside of the county naturally. And so those business associations are going to also potentially create conflicts or potentially create conflicts in, in your county world. So, so first is misuse of resources. And so the general idea here is that we shouldn't be using our county resources for personal use. And those resources can include vehicles, they can include equipment, computers, internet, um, telephones, supplies, et cetera. Um, it also includes time as well. So, so not just necessarily supplies, but how we're actually spending our time when we should be acting as stewards, as stewards of the public. So as you may recall, we had the issue with the uh, county process servers a few years back where there was a report that there was an employee who was misreporting their time, reporting that they were working eight hours a day when, in fact, they were only working about three to four. And so this was an issue that we that we investigated and looked at and determined that it was actually more than just this one employee, that it was the entire department. Right. And that it was an issue that <clears throat> the employees were being directed by their supervisors to report that they were working eight hours a day when, in fact, they weren't. And it was a situation that ultimately resulted in about four to five hundred thousand dollars worth of stolen time um, that we were able to identify and make recommendations on restructuring that department, um, which actually is, is currently in the process of being phased out um, for for efficiency purposes. So. Um, but again, so using county resources, including printing, mailing, uh, electronic communication, whether it's personal or political. So these are things that we want to be mindful about. We shouldn't be using county resources for all personal use and certainly not for political use either. either. Um, now, granted, a de minimis use is OK. So we've said that, um, and, and again, important to, to state rules, that if there is a limited use, it does not rise to the level of an ethics violation. And again, those are things where we're talking about surfing the web or things like taking a personal phone call, right? Things that we can't necessarily monetize or it would take us resources and time to be able to monetize it. But the things that we can monetize, we absolutely shouldn't be doing, right? So we shouldn't be printing off even just that one flyer, right? The church picnic flyer, the, the political advisory, the, the marketing or promotional material, those types of things we should absolutely should not be doing even on that one sheet of paper. Um, <clears throat> so misuse of official position here we're talking about we shouldn't be using our positions to secure a financial or material benefit to ourselves, to a relative, or to an organization in which we have an interest. And so the question you kind of want to ask yourself, if something comes before you in your county capacity, and by acting on it, it's going to affect you, it's going to affect a relative, or it's going to affect an organization in which you have an interest, you want to ask yourself, would I have had the opportunity to act on this if it weren't for my county position? And if the answer is no, then it's more than likely going to be a misuse of your position to move forward on that. OK, so so in that situation, a lot of times what comes up is uh, or the questions we get usually surround. Well, I'm not making the final decision or I'm not going to vote on this. I'm just making a recommendation to use X business or to use Y business. Right. But if it's going to potentially benefit a relative or another organization or yourselves, it's going to be a misuse of your position. Okay. Um, 
Another issue that comes up deals with deals with supervisors, of course. And so, again, in, in leadership capacity, we want to be mindful about we should not be coercing or otherwise requiring employees or other officials to act in ways that are unreasonably outside of the scope of employment. Now, if it's related to county business, then, then that's fair game. But again, we shouldn't be having employees or other officials uh, we shouldn't be having them walking our dogs. We shouldn't be having them, you know, do our, our pick up our dry cleaning or order Ubers or, or any of those types of things um, with without just compensation. And so, again, so a lot of times what happens is people have side jobs or employees or officials may have other jobs going on. And so um, one of the issues that always arises is. There's a question of, hey, I have this outside company and I want you to come work for me in my side business, too. Right. And so, again, we want to make sure that there is a, a clear delineation there um, because it, it, it creates all types of issues. And so so we want to be mindful about about those type of entanglements, especially especially as it relates to leadership. Um, so a few other examples include accessing information for personal reasons. So, again, as as employees, as officials, we all have access um, to confidential information. And so we absolutely shouldn't be accessing that information for personal use. Right. So, again, we certainly want to make sure that we stress that all of us have things going on outside of the county. We have relationships going on outside of the county. Right. And so we have friends and family. And, and particularly when you're in a role where you have higher access to information, um, it, it's our friends and family that tend to get us in trouble in these types of situations. Our friends and family that says, hey, can you check on this for me? Or, hey, you're you're on county council. Can you can you look into this for me? Can you see what's going on with that? OK. And these are the things that potentially are a misuse of your position, because, again, go back to that question. Would I have had access to this opportunity? Would I have had access to to do whatever it is that you're about to do if it weren't for your county employment or if it weren't for your county, your county position? Um, <clears throat> again, the instructing uh, subordinate employees or officials to act outside of their their jobs, um, financial entanglements become become a big issue as well. Um, soliciting or accepting gifts again, which all of these we'll, we'll get a little bit into in a moment, um, but also suppressing public records. So again, uh, as you know, we have an obligation to be transparent to the public, and it's important that we do what we can not to manipulate, destroy, or otherwise suppress public records. So, um, which includes any document, device, item, regardless of its physical form. So also can be electronic as well. Um, anything that is created or received by any public office um, is potentially subject to public records or sunshine laws. And so, again, um, the maintenance of that is really important. So we want to make sure that public records that are requested by the general public, that they're available for copying, for inspection, um, at any time or without unreasonable delay. Um, otherwise, you know, we're, we're ultimately liable for, for penalties, including attorney's fees, um, as it relates to unreasonable delays with, with public records requests. So we want to make sure that we're not doing anything um, that, that is consistent or that is inconsistent with that. Um, so misuse of confidential information. So this is the area that does not fall within the county ethics code, but it is state law that we follow. And so here, Ohio ethics law prohibits the disclosure, misuse, and improper access of confidential information. So again, we all have access to confidential information. So we want to make sure that we're not doing anything to misuse that or that we're not improperly accessing that. So for example, if it's not an actual project assignment um, uh, report or, or some type of task that you're doing in your official capacity, Access, even accessing that confidential information can be a misuse of your resource or excuse me, a misuse of your position as well as a misuse of confidential information. And that improper access piece is, or piece is really key. And that's one of the issues that, that we see a lot in our office, um, particularly in our in our HHS departments and um, in, let's see, uh, in the courts and the jails. And so, again, another issue where. It's our friends and family that get us in trouble that say, hey, can you check on this for me? Hey, I have a have a new boyfriend. I want to see if that boyfriend has has any child support outstanding out. Right. Or I want to see if the new girlfriend I have has, has been in jail before. Right. So those are the types of things that we don't want to do. And, and we see it often um, because, again, naturally, our friends and family think 
hey, you have access to this information and you have easy access to it. Can you look it up for me and see what's going on? Hey, I have a relative who is receiving benefits from the county. Can you see what's happening with that? Or hey, they, they can't or they got denied for this. Can you see what's going on? So those are the things you want to make sure that you aren't engaging in or using your position to otherwise access. Um, and so, again, it's not just the databases that we have access to, but it's seeing information, it's overhearing information, conversations with coworkers, with, with, uh, with, with colleagues, et cetera. That, and, and again, this is prohibited both during and after your time in public service. So this is not just while you sit on council. This is lifetime. Any confidential information that you have acquired during that time, you want to make sure that you are um, – that you are keeping confidential. This is lifetime, okay? Um, and a really, really, really important piece. Okay, so, so moving a little bit more into conflicts of interest, um, it's important to note that it is not a violation to have a conflict of interest, okay? So that's often a misconception, right? It's not a violation to have a conflict of interest. What matters is what you do with it. Okay, if and when that conflict actually presents itself. So again, we all have relationships outside of the county. We none of us expect for any of us to live and breathe coming to work at Cuyahoga County, right? Or serving Cuyahoga County. Um, and another key point here is that we do business with thousands of different organizations, right? Like how many how many things do you guys approve on on a regular basis in terms of contractors and potential vendors that we work with? Does, do any of you right here, right now, know a hundred off the top of your head? Anybody? Right? And so, so the point is, in any given situation, you have no idea where your conflicts lie in that moment. Okay? That's why that's important. Um, and again, we can look it up and we can figure that out, but that's what our office is here for, to be able to answer those questions, to be able to give you guidance on doing that. And a number of you, have, um, you know, and, and all of you actually have been really, really good about that in terms of asking questions. Hey, I got these tickets. Hey, I got invited to this conference. Am I allowed to go? Is there any issues with that? And so we certainly appreciate that. And we absolutely encourage the, the continuity of those questions because it's really important because a lot of times you literally just may not know where your potential conflicts lie. Okay, so again, it's not a problem to have a conflict. It's about what you do with that conflict that matters. And so, so as we define a conflict of interest, what's important to note is that it's a direct or material benefit. Okay, so it does not necessarily have to be financial. Okay, it can be a material as defined in other ways. Um, now, this does not apply to uh, benefits that are generally available, and we'll get a little bit more into that as well. Um, but again, to yourselves, to a relative, or to an organization in which you have an interest. It also includes an interest in a contract. So again, as, as public officials or as public servants, we cannot have an interest in a public contract, period. That's, just, that's state law. It's not county code. It's Ohio revised code. We cannot have an interest in a public contract um, that our public agency enters into, okay? Um, whether it's direct, whether it's indirect. And so um, it also includes our interest in, in organization as well. So if you have an outside role, say you sit on the board, you are, are, are an officer of another organization, um, any organization or entity where you took an oath or you made a commitment to act in the best interest of that organization, that also potentially creates a conflict. Because again, we want to be mindful about having dual roles, right? You don't want to be in a position where you sit on the board for this organization, but you sit on council here and you potentially have to make decisions that affect each other, okay? Potential conflict also relates to any stock or ownership share. So again, if you if you own another company or if you have stock or shares in another company, if it's five percent or more, then it potentially creates a conflict. If it's less than five percent, then the state has said that it's that that interest is remote enough to where it probably doesn't create a conflict. But five percent or more, then then you want to make sure that um, that you're mindful of that and, and disclose that. So if and when a conflict comes up, um, the requirement is that we disclose it and that we recuse ourselves from any actual or potential matters where we have both a county and a personal interest. So the disclosure piece 
is is easy. Put it in writing to our office, right? We have that on writing that, hey, excuse me, there's a conflict of interest. Um, but it's the recusal piece that's really, really, really important. And so I can't stress this enough that for the recusal piece, it's required that we disengage in all participation whatsoever. Okay, It is not just about the final vote. So it is not saying, hey, I want to have my two cents or I'm going to put in input on X, Y, and Z, but now I'm not going to vote on it. Okay? That is not, that is absolutely not a proper recusal. Okay? You want to make sure that if you have a conflict that you are not involved in any participation whatsoever, that absolutely includes discussion. Okay, whether it's verbal, whether it's nonverbal, right? So you don't want to sit in the meeting and oh, you're turning your nose up, or oh no, don't do this, don't do that, right? That's we we also don't want that to happen as well, okay? Because um, again, it potentially creates a conflict. Um, and again, we're talking about things where we have the exercise of discretion on, and which which highly relates to to your roles here as as counsel. Um, because that's exactly what, what you're going to be doing if, when things come before you in your county capacity. And again, if you are uncertain, just reach out to us and ask. We are more than happy to, to do the analysis. We are more than happy to give you guidance on how to appropriately recuse yourselves from, from any potential conflicts. Um, so again, as we talk about recusal, which again is the important piece here, you don't want to participate um, at all. OK, um, so again, a lot of times and this is the question that we get all the time from from across the county is, well, if I don't make the final decision or if I don't vote on it or I'm just going to abstain from voting. Right. Because, you know, in, in other circumstances, that may be what has deemed to be the proper way to recuse yourself is just to abstain from voting. But in this context, that is is not the case. It needs to be all participation. So. Um, so I, I cannot stress stress that enough um, as it relates to recusing yourself from conflicts of interest. And then if it's a situation where the matter can be reassigned um, to to other colleagues, then then that's what you want to make sure that that you do. OK. OK, so <clears throat> um, another issue that comes up is dealing with nepotism. And there is a special F word associated with nepotism. Any of you take a quick guess on what that F word is? Family. Family. A little stronger than family. What was that? Y'all know some F words. <laughs> okay, the F word we're talking about here, though, is felony. Okay? So, so be mindful that, that nepotism is a fourth degree felony in the state of Ohio. OK, fourth degree felony in the state of Ohio. So, again, going back to the issues that we had in the jail and, and, and the warden, um, other issues that we've seen through, throughout the county. And, and this is by far the biggest issue that the state ethics commission sees statewide as it relates to government ethics deals with nepotism. OK, so we want to be really, really, really mindful about the, the activities that we engage in um, as it relates to enabling or otherwise participating um, in nepotism issues. And so again, it, it's prohibited for uh, any person to participate in any decision to hire, promote, discipline, or discharge a relative. Okay, so again, employees, officials, we cannot be in supervisor subordinate relationships. So again, fourth degree felony, bad, so stay away from it. So while Nepotism, while nepotism is the biggest issue that we see at the state level, here in the county, the biggest issue that we see deals with gifts, okay? Um, specifically tickets as it relates to, to sporting events, to outings, to conferences, to, um, to entertainment events. And so here, it's important to note that elected officials and employees, we cannot solicit or accept things of value that have both a substantial and an improper influence with respect to our duties. OK, so that's the official legal definition. But we have three moving parts here. OK, the first is a thing of value. A thing of value can be anything. It can be an ink pen, piece of paper. It can be the keychain. It could be a meal. It could be tickets, cash, gift cards, receipts. Um, you know, all of these things can be a thing of value, but that thing of value has to be both substantial 
and it has to be improper. Okay, and so for the substantial in this piece, we're looking at what is the value of that gift, um, and things like tickets, uh, discounts. Uh, golf outings, all of those things, don't even question it, is more than likely going to be substantial. Okay, The things that we don't consider to be substantial, we're talking about meals of a routine character. So for example, a contractor comes in and they bring a continental breakfast. Right? They bring sandwiches. That's a meal of a routine character. If they're bringing in steak and lobster, and, and now we got a problem. Okay. We're looking at how much money did that contractor or did that vendor spend to, to secure or otherwise further their business with the county. Okay. Because we don't want a situation where that influence somehow plays a factor in who we do business with. Right? So we don't want to have that in our minds to figure, okay, we just entertained all these bids from different vendors. Well, the only one that sticks out is the one that brought the steak and lobster. Right? Those are the types of situations that we don't want to or influences that we don't want to have. Um, so, again, if it's substantial in value, um, it, it's going to potentially be a problem if it comes from an improper source. Um, also, something that's not substantial in value or generally not substantial are promotional items. OK, so feel free to you can take the ink pen, you can take the swag bag, the water bottles, the keychains. Those things are fine. Um, just don't take the company car. And I think I think we'll be OK. Right. So so the smaller things. OK. The bigger things. Not not OK. Um, <clears throat> so again, if it's substantial in value and if it comes from an improper source, it's going to be not okay to solicit it or to accept it. And how we define an improper source is any business company, organization, entity, or person that is doing business with the county, seeking to do business with the county, regulated by the county, or interested in matters before the county. Okay. So, and the reason again, why this is important or why my question earlier was important is because Again, at any given moment, you have no idea whether or not you're receiving something because of your county capacity. OK, and so that's something that you really want to be mindful of, because, again, unless you know every single business that we do business with and all the business who want to do business with us. Right. You don't know whether or not that gift you receive, that meal you receive, that drink you receive, that those tickets you receive are purposely to influence you in any potential business that, that could be done later. So again, um, this is why we encourage those questions um, that you ask us, you know, and that we give you guidance on how to navigate those situations. So again, if it's a thing of value, it's substantial in nature, and it comes from an improper source, you cannot accept it. You also cannot solicit, solicit it as well. Now, there are some exceptions. So gifts commonly given for special occasions are, are generally an exception. Um, so many of us like to think our birthdays are a special occasion, um, but it's not. OK, and let me tell you how not special your birthday is in this particular context. OK, so you don't want a situation. Um, you know, we had. Uh, let's see, what was it? Uh, so the former county official that had a birthday club and as a part of the birthday club, um, employees were required to make a contribution to, to this official on their birthdays. Okay, and so these, and, and if you did not make that contribution, then something negative or adverse were go was going to happen or was certain to happen as it relates to your employment. Okay, and so these are the types of issues that we that we don't want to have um, because again, the official was ultimately indicted and convicted on thirty one counts of ethics violations. Okay, um, and it was said that the the official there generated upwards of five to six hundred thousand dollars over the course of their career in terms of money that ultimately was embezzled from 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 their employees. OK, so again, don't go to jail for your birthday. It's not worth it. OK, what we are talking about as it relates to special occasions are things that don't happen on a recurring basis. So um, somebody has a death in the family. Somebody retires, somebody uh, has a baby, somebody gets married. Those types of things are what we consider to be special occasions, not birthdays, not holidays. Okay? Another, uh, another exception is where the official pays face value. So if somebody offers you tickets, somebody offers you a meal and you actually pay for it, then it's not a gift anymore because you paid for it. Right. So so that's the theory there. And then lastly, our Oprah rule um, that, that we've deemed in our office says that gifts and discounts that are provided to the county 
or provided to everyone is presumed not to be improper. Okay, so the idea here is that if you get a gift and you get a gift, then everybody gets to have a gift. Okay, now this is within reason. So if you know or have reason to know that a gift is intended to influence you, okay, then it still can potentially be problematic, even if it's given to all of you. Okay, so again, something else that you want to be mindful of as it as it relates to gifts. And again, this is by far the biggest issue that we see that we see here in the county. So we know that you have uh, other sessions to get to. So this uh, kind of wraps up what we have to, to talk about today. Uh, we appreciate your time and we are always available. We love uh, all interaction with you. Any comments or questions that you have, we, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that was the fastest I've ever seen him do an hour long presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I see we have some forms here in front of us to sign. You want us to? Yes, Mr. President. I will uh, pick those up after the when you guys go into executive session. Okay. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Deputy Inspector General. Um, Inspector General. All right. Well, we have a executive session, and. Um, as you know, all meetings of the Cuyahoga County Council are open to the public under the Ohio Open Meeting Laws. Under that law, council may go into executive session during a meeting for specifically authorized purposes. During the executive session, council confers outside of the hearing of the public. Council may not make any decisions about any matter in executive session. All decisions are made in public. This afternoon, the council will go into executive session to discuss collective bargaining matters. During this time, our live stream will be down, and we will ask all those not needed for the executive session to remain in the council chambers. Council members will convene in the adjacent room A, and will re-enter the room, re-enter the meeting once the executive session has ended. Uh, is there a motion to go into executive session for the purposes of discussing collective bargaining matters? So moved. And moved and second. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Moving to executive session, Ms. Simon? Yes. Ms. Baker? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Tuma. Yes. Mr. Yes. Gallagher? Yes. Mr. Schron? Yes. Ms. Conwell? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Ms. Stevens? Yes. Council President Brady? Yes. Motion carries. All right. The ayes have it. We'll adjourn the meeting for an executive session. We're good? All right. Uh, we are reconvening the Committee of the Whole, and we are now back on the record. And um, we are uh, adjourned from the um